Hi, and welcome to this session on the best CLI trial. My name is Dan Caradice, and along with my co-chair, Thanos Saratsis, we'll be representing Vascular Research UK and speaking with the chief investigators of the best CLI trial, Dr. Alec Farber and Dr. Matthew Minard. Uh, good morning. Uh, I'm excited to talk about uh, the best CLI trial. Um, which uh, is sponsored by the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, and uh, with additional support provided by industry and physician societies. BestCLI um, was a prospective randomized multi-center, multi-specialty pragmatic clinical trial whose goal was to compare clinical effectiveness, functional outcomes, and cost in patients with CLTI and infrainguinal PAD who are candidates for both open vascular surgery and endovascular therapy. Patients with CLTI who had infrainguinal PAD were evaluated by non-invasive studies to corroborate that they had severe ischemia. Those considered to be high risk for surgery were excluded. Only patients who were judged by investigators to be candidates for both surgery and endovascular were included. Those patients underwent ultrasound of their great saphenous vein and imaging studies of leg arteries. An investigator credentialed in open surgery had to agree with one credentialed in endovascular that any given patient was a candidate for the trial. Because the results of bypass are strongly influenced by choice of conduit and single segment grade saphenous vein is judged to be the best conduit for bypass, patients were placed into two cohorts. Cohort one included patients with single segment grade saphenous vein, while in cohort two, patients randomized to surgery would be treated by alternative conduits, including prosthetic grafts. These co cohorts were uh, treated as separate parallel trials and not pooled. We chose to stratify our cohorts by clinical presentation, rest pain alone versus tissue loss, and anatomy based on whether significant tibial disease was present, so as to balance randomization across these important variables. The hypothesis for cohort one was that bypass with single segment saphenous vein would outperform endovascular therapy, and for cohort two, that bypass without single segment saphenous vein. Uh, would not do as well. The primary endpoint was a major adverse film event or all cause death. Male was defined as above ankle amputation or first major intervention, uh, defined as either new bypass, surgical interposition graft, surgical thrombectomy, or thrombolysis. And this uh, a portion of the endpoint was adjudicated by a clinical events committee, as was myocardial infarction and stroke. We had a number of secondary endpoints. BEST uh, was run across 150 sites in Canada, United States, Italy, Finland, and New Zealand. We had more than 1,000 investigators representing the fields of vascular surgery, interventional cardiology, interventional radiology. Uh, three quarters of our sites were uh, multidisciplinary, and we did everything possible to encourage multidisciplinary collaboration. Here are the results of uh, cohort one. So we had 1,434 patients in cohort one. Uh, you can see uh, that the crossover rates uh, listed on the slide uh, are, are lower than those were expect, expected. The median follow-up was 2.7 years. Um, uh, medical therapy, uh, although at baseline was lower than one would, one would hope, at 30 days uh, was significantly higher. Uh, we had 698 bypass procedures and 1,250 endovascular procedures across uh, the SFA, popliteal artery, and tibial pedal segments. When you look at the inter uh, endovascular interventions, um, you can see how the most common one for uh, the superficial femoral artery were bare metal stents, um, while for the popliteal artery, uh, it was drug coat of balloon angioplasty, and for the tibial artery, it was um, angioplasty alone, uh, which currently is a standard of care in this space. And 19% of our patients uh, had uh, only angioplasty used uh, alone without any other interventions. So here are the main findings. The primary endpoint occurred in 42.6% of patients in the surgery arm and 57.4 patients in the endovascular arm. With a hazard ratio of 0.68, surgical bypass was associated with a 32% reduction of in male or all-cause death. 
This finding was driven by significantly more first major interventions in the endovascular arm. There were 74 above ankle amputations in the surgery arm and 106 in the endovascular arm was translated to a 27% reduction in amputations in the surgery arm. There is no significance in all cause deaths. Uh, this is uh, the uh, uh, capital Meyer curve of the primary uh, endpoint, which shows that surgical bypass significantly outperformed endovascular therapy. This difference was evident early and persisted throughout the course of the trial. The absolute risk reduction median follow up uh, of 2.7 years was 10.3%. Uh, you can see the patients randomized to endo were significantly more likely to have major interventions. Uh, and significantly more likely to have uh, an above ankle amputation. There's no difference in death. Uh, if you look at the subgroup analysis, there are significant treatment effects uh, favoring surgery across most subgroups. When you look at total number of major interventions over the entire course of the trial, the incidence of such major interventions was more than 2.5 uh, fold higher in the uh, endovascular arm, and as you can see, these curves appear to diverge. There is no difference in MACE, either at 30 days or over the course of the trial uh, uh, between arms. Uh, one of the questions that was asked was whether the difference in the curves was driven by early failure in the endo arm. Uh, and so you, I, I'm showing the major interventions on the left and the uh, primary endpoint on the right. And so it is true that uh, 99 of 233 first major interventions occurred within 30 days, and of which 84 were in the end of arm, and 80% uh, of these interventions uh, was bypass alone. And in terms of technical failure in the end of arm, it was 15%. It was uh, of 108 cases of technical failure, 61% were achieved the bypass within 30 days. But when we did sensitivity analyses that excluded endo patients who had technical failures and a primary outcome event or were censored, or excluded endo patients who had technical failure regardless of a primary event and censored, or excluded patients who had either a primary end of, uh, outcome event uh, or was censored, there was no significant difference between arms. The difference, uh, I'm sorry, the difference between the arms still stood uh, favoring surgery. Here results of cohort two. Uh, there were 396 patients in cohort two. Those are followed for a median uh, of 1.6 years. Uh, and uh, in terms of the primary endpoint, there was no difference in the primary endpoint. Uh, there were more uh, major interventions in the endovascular arm. So the study uh, was limited uh, by its pragmatic design. And so there's possibility for selection and operator bias and enrollment and intervention. Uh, equipoise and eligibility were determined locally and likely to be variable. There was procedural heterogeneity. Cohort two was likely underpowered. Anatomic complexity is yet to be evaluated, but will be evaluated. We have plans to do that. The percentage of female patients was lower than targeted. Uh, the use of paclitaxel coated balloons and stents during enrollment was uh, likely affected by the Katsanos meta-analysis, and we're currently unpacking that information right as we speak. In summary, surgery was more effective in endovascular therapy among CLTI with adequate saphenous vein. Uh, who were eligible with either strategy, that were reduced uh, primary endpoint, fewer major interventions, and fewer major um, um, major amputations. In patients who did not have adequate saphenous vein, there were no significant differences in the primary efficacy endpoint. There were no differences in preoperative mortality or MACE. Mortality and MACE were similar over the course of follow-up. And so we uh, conclude that in CLTI, both surgical and endovascular revascularization strategies are effective. Bypass with adequate saphenous vein is a more effective strategy for patients deemed suitable for both open endovascular approaches. Uh, patients who are candidates for limb salvage should undergo an evaluation of surgical risk and conduit availability. Bypass with adequate saphenous vein should be offered as a first-line treatment option for suitable candidates with CLTI as part of a fully informed shared decision-making. Level one evidence from best CLI does not support an endovascular first approach to all patients with CLTI. It does support a complementary role for open and endovascular vascularization strategy and highlights the need for expertise in both for optimal care of these patients.
Thank you and congratulations once again for completing such an important and well-designed trial and for such a clear presentation. We're going to move on to some questions now and I'll start if I may. Regarding cohort one, I think it's apparent from the numbers that not all of the patients presenting to the recruiting centres with CLTI were included in the trial and I was wondering what information you had about the numbers of patients that actually presented to these centres and how they were treated. Yeah, you're asking a question about the patients who were not enrolled in the trial and that's always an important question because a randomised trial is, is, uh, is it represents a selected uh, a population of patients and that's sort of the nature of the beast. We tried very hard to have a concurrent registry of patients who um, uh, would be followed um, uh, at, at the same time as the trial itself. Now, unfortunately, we were not be able to, were able to get this funded in time, but uh, uh, there is a registry that was uh, is going accruing as we speak, and so it started a little bit late, off kilter, not really the, the same patients, but. Once this registry uh, finishes collect, uh, uh, collecting its data, which is expected to be in a couple of months, we'll have about a thousand patients that can we can we we'll learn more about. Um, um. Okay, that's really helpful, and and we look forward to seeing that. Um, so, in terms of cohort one, your, your conclusion is that patients who are of suitable risk for surgery and have uh, a great venous vein available, um, the optimal strategy will be to perform a bypass in preference to an endo first approach. Um, what do you think are the exceptions to this? Which patients do you think we should be approaching first with endo? Well, I think the, the main question that we have not yet answered is the anatomy that should drive this decision. We, we uh, are in the process uh, of collecting uh, angiograms and uh, other cross imaging studies that were used for uh, for random um, um, enrollment. Uh, and at that point, once we evaluate those angiograms, we'll be able to ha have a much better picture about who exactly uh, needs to be offered bypass first. So I'll give you an example. Uh, I, I did a, a, a angiogram last week on a patient with CLTI who had good vein, but she had uh, several stenoses uh, in the SFA, uh, tibial perineal trunk, and the anterior tibial artery. And I actually did not have equipoise. I ended up treating it endovascularly. So I think in the end, what I suspect we're going to find is that um, patients um, who have difficult anatomy for endovascular, or, or I should say the other way around, patients who are going to have easy anatomy for endovascular are probably going to be offered endovascular therapy, while those who's got, who have significant long occlusions uh, probably should be offered by that. Okay, thank you. Um, Thanos, do you have any questions on, on cohort one? Um, yeah, thank you very much. Um, that was a great presentation. Just one question really, um, regarding to the type of technologies used in um, the endovascular arm, uh, from the appendix on the paper, it's clear that we're looking at predominantly plain angioplasty a few bare metal stents, a few DCBs. How do you think in the future we'll be able to look at all of the new endovascular technologies that are coming through? Um, and is there going to be some form of sub-analysis looking at whether these newer technologies like DCBs or DSs made any difference with regards to your endovascular arms? So you're asking a good question, and unfortunately, uh, we um, did not do a good job at presenting these data. These data are presented by by segment, and so what you're said, what you just said, is completely incorrect. In fact, it is not true that the majority of patients had angioplasty alone. Only 19% of patients had angioplasty alone, and as you 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 probably agree or understand that in the tibial arteries, angioplasty alone is the standard of care. So unfortunately, our data is being misinterpreted, and it's our fault. We didn't. We didn't. It's highly complicated as to how to sort of <laughs> present these data. And you can see from the slide that I showed, where I show interventions by segment, you can see how angioplasty is not a major uh, component in the SFA and popliteal. So uh, we are going to do a better job at actually uh, broadcasting 
the, the, the real truth, which is again, angioplasty was used in about 19% of patients, uh, which we think is an acceptable number. The drug code, we are in the process of, uh, of figuring out what percentage of our patients received uh, drug uh, technology. We think it's gonna be close to 40%, but again, uh, that data is not yet available, will be available next week, and we are going to set the record right. Uh, we believe that uh, despite what some people have said on Twitter, uh, uh, the interventions that were used were uh, very um, uh, um, descriptive of what's currently being used in the space in the real world. Thank you. That, that's very clear. That's fantastic. Thanks. Thanks, Alan. And I think that's a really important point to draw out because that's certainly one of the, the major talking points online. Um, just looking at the basic medical therapy, um, I know I think we're all slightly disappointed when we audit the basic medical therapy our patients receive in, in clinical practice and, and certainly in trials as well. Do you think that the quality of basic medical therapy and the smoking rates and things might have disadvantaged the endo arm as opposed to the surgical arm with the fresher endothelium? Well, that's a very good question. Uh, unfortunately, uh, a question that uh, cannot be answered by the best CLI, obviously. Uh, we, um, again, a, you know, it's very tricky when, when you, when you include the data uh, for the New England Journal of Medicine, uh, it's a very limited amount of space that you have. And so we presented uh, baseline optimal medical therapy data, and we're criticized for n not being, uh, you know, adequately uh, n treating our patients. But the reality is that, you know, uh, at 30 days, 75% of our patients uh, were on statins. And, you know, maybe 80% is a nicer number, but if you look at the literature, 75% is, is, is really within the range of what's described. And the same thing for antiplatelet agents. Now, obviously, the differences in, in um, medical therapy as it relates to outcomes of these arms is an interesting question. And we, will, uh, we have plans to, to write several papers to try to unpack that. But at this point, I can't answer the question that, that you asked. Okay, thank you. I think that's that's really interesting, and obviously it is reflective of, of yeah, practice. Well, it's, a, it's an advanced um, point that I think people are trying to make when they raise that, that somehow the fact that medical therapy was low um, disadvantaged the endoarm, and it's, it's not accurate for the reasons Alex said. Those were entry data. Um, but, you know, like Voyager and Compass and the basal trials, we're really hoping that our data set will help answer this very question. You know, what medical therapy is important for, for surgery and what is for endo? Like the results for Voyager are just as, you know, Zeralto is just as important for surgery as it is for endo, but people don't really realize that. So. A lot of nuances there that hopefully we'll be able to answer the question, but there's no evidence that, you know, starting out a baseline with low levels at the endo arm is as disadvantaged. It's, it's important to see what happens during the course of the trial, which we'll look at. Just moving on to cohort two, um, you, you've been quite candid about some of the challenges of, of getting the trial done, getting the numbers, getting the follow up. Um, there does seem to be a difference between the groups, although it doesn't reach statistical significance and, and as you say, maybe due to underpowering and things. What do you think we should do to understand this particular group better? Well, I think that certainly when you look at, at, the, at the cohort two, you can appreciate how it's likely underpowered um, and that there is no difference in the primary endpoint. On the other hand, um, you know, the, the, the directionality is favoring surgery. Now, we are not uh, talking about that uh, because it's a, it's, it's, it's a, it's a theoretical consideration. Uh, we're accepting the, the, the hypothesis that there is no difference. There might be a difference. Uh, it's hard to know. Uh, and certainly, we did not answer that question. Uh, we hope that best CLI and the, the basal family of trials that are about to come out uh, are going to encourage others to ask 
these questions and other questions uh, in this in space to to give us more evidence base. Yeah, I, I think it's really encouraging how good the the surgical results were in in that challenging group. Obviously, a large number of people had um, uh, venous conduits, but even for the prosthetic groups, they they seem to be doing much better than than was observed in the original Basel trial some time ago. So, just a quick comment. You know, Alec alluded to this concept of the everything points in the favor, or a lot of things point in the favor of surgery being more effective in core two. As well, and you do have to be careful, obviously, if it's unpowered. But um, the the bigger point that we're also not really making is that they're equal. So, it, in some levels, them yeah. being equal is sort of a win for endo. Yeah. Yes. Because of the kind of invasiveness of open surgery, but um, I think we just need to look at that a bit more. To really understand what are the of each in that particular cohort, because it's it's a pretty common scenario, obviously, as you know. For my last question, I'd like to move on to some of the barriers around delivering these very large trials. Clearly, you face some challenges and barriers, and I just wondered if we could start to unpack some of that and what advice you have to those of us who are contemplating performing large randomized trials within vascular surgery. Well, I think that uh, these, um, you know, executing these trials it, it is it's hard. Uh, and when we uh, executed uh, Best CLI, um, you know, there are all sorts of challenges. And I could probably spend an hour just talking about these challenges. Uh, uh, and we have talks like that. Uh, I think uh, for for this particular trial, uh, the hard part was the the. Um, the individual equipoise versus the community equipoise. So most people would agree that there is uncertainty about how to best treat any given patient, but most people thought that they knew how to treat their patient, even though their partner might have a completely different idea. And so to convince those people to suspend their bias and enroll the patient uh, into the trial was extraordinarily difficult and required Matt, Kenny, and I to do a lot of traveling, do a lot of cajoling. At some point, I really felt like a salesperson. Um, uh, but I, and so it was very difficult. Uh, I think that to, to your question uh, about what the advice is, I mean, again, this is a not enough time to answer your question fully, but I think you have to surround yourself with good people. You have to have a good idea, good idea that's, that needs to be answered. Question needs to be answered. You have to surround yourself with good people um, to round out your, um, you know, your, your team uh, and 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 not be scared that you're approaching, you know, you're, you're, you're about to climb on Everest. Um, not be scared of that because at the end of the day, if you keep climbing, uh, at some point you'll get to the top if you have enough perseverance. Thank you, I think that's a great answer. Matthew, you wanted to come back on some of the earlier questions. Yeah, well, I'll just chime in on that one too. You know, everything Alex said and then get a good partner, <laughs> uh, tenacity and uh, really, ignore all the naysayers you know in our case there was a lot of people that didn't think that we had a chance in hell of kind of doing what we did but we just sort of soldiered on and um you know we did a lot of things we hear this all the time and kind of had a sense that it was true as it was happening but we did a lot of things that were not done before we constantly tried to think outside the box um you know we run around to a bazillion sites paid house calls, really twisted arms when we thought we needed to, and but were aided by the question that everyone thought really needed to be answered. And we had a lot of good luck that that didn't change over the 10 to 12 years we were doing this. Thank you for the helpful comments. Um, Thanos, do you have any final questions or remarks? Um, I, I'm aware of the time. Um, I think it's been very enlightening. Um, I, I honestly don't have very much to add. Uh, I'm looking forward to more data coming out uh, in order to look at the endovascular treatments and the medical treatments, but this was really eye-opening in some ways. 
I agree. I think this has been a really helpful session um, and I've certainly learned a lot beyond what, what I have reading the papers and I thank you very much for your time and uh, well done for this incredible achievement completing this trial. Thank you. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you very much. Take care, gentlemen. Bye-bye. I hope you enjoyed that session on the best CLI trial. The take-home messages for me are firstly that open surgical bypass and endovascular treatment are both good options in the management of infrainguinal occlusive disease causing chronic limb-threatening ischemia. The second take-home message is that in patients who are fit for open surgical bypass and have an available great venous vein of suitable quality, those patients do better with a bypass first rather than an endo first approach. We've heard the CIs of the trial come back about uh, concerns raised about the quality of the endovascular procedures, the quality of best medical therapy, and the generalizability of the trial. Perhaps concerningly, we've also heard about the real challenges with delivering these large randomized trials, which provide such great evidence for the management of our patients. Perhaps the biggest barrier is the abandonment of equipoise in treating clinicians and the unwillingness to enter patients into trials. This is a huge problem and it stands in the way of research, it stands in the way of progress and it stands in the way of improving outcomes for our patients. I really hope that you enjoyed this video. Please click to like and subscribe. We have some incredible videos coming up in the future on uh, issues such as the UK Compass trial and I look forward to seeing you there. Goodbye.